All right, so this is, um, this is week six, and we're going to call this lecture 11. Uh, it sounds like Tim and Mark were uh, able to get through the majority of chapter five with you. Um, I'm going to start right in on chapter six because you've got a, um, an exam on chapters five and six at the end of the week. And since this is the day that I'm, I'm with you, I want to make sure that you're clear on a lot of the concepts of chapter six. I, I've mentioned this before um, that the, the even chapters of this textbook are sort of my favorites because they're the most technical. They kind of dig down into the nitty gritty of a lot of the theory. And, you know, frankly, if you do not understand the second law of thermodynamics, um, you're, you're missing out on a lot. And so that's what we're going to primarily focus on today. Um, I even sat down with um, one of our Nobel laureates here on campus, and he was very confused as to why coal-fired power plants can't be any more efficient than 35 or 40 percent. And, you know, he's a, he's a fantastic scientist, but um, whatever reason, it was, was not clear um, why you can't achieve, you know, greater efficiency. That's what we're going to focus on primarily today. Any other questions on logistics? I think um, Tim just got done saying that you guys are doing a great job on your summaries. Um, and uh, there was, there was one, one concern that, well, what if I have summarized the entire paper in 250 words and I can't squeeze out another 50? Well, get creative. You know, it, it's, it's, it's um, college. Use that opportunity to express your opinion and um, set some tasks for yourself. Get ready for 102. Put an equation in there. Find another paper. In, in 102, you're going to have to actually uh, review two papers per summary. So warm up on 102, dig in to some of the references that are there, and, and, and go after them. And that's, that's really what um, you will be doing as you become a lifelong learner in renewable energy technology, because there's always going to be another technology coming out there. Your customer's going to know, well, what about the, what about the, what about the, you, you need to go after that and get ahead of it. So, okay. So anyway, great job on your summaries. Tim was saying that, you know, this semester's class is, um, you know, at week four or five is typically where we might see students in week uh, 12 or 14. So, you know, pat yourselves on the back for that. Okay. Um, so we have spent um, a fair amount of time up to now. So with, um, you know, with the last uh, chapter on coal, um, I know you did a lot of thermal equations. And I can, I can review one equation for you briefly. Um, and we'll just go over some units. A few people are like, oh, I got I to gotta figure out my units. So let's just review. Um, I know we've talked already a lot about the difference between units and dimensions. We talked about mass, length, and time. Hopefully you've been like having little dreams at night about what that means. And it's, it's fun because I think a lot of us are sort of visual thinkers. And it is kind of fun to think how, how massive something is, how wide, long, et cetera, how long something lasts. So hopefully that's starting to sink in too. But um, chapter six, this is heat to motive power. And obviously, heat is a form of energy. That was a discussion that happened between James Jewell and Lord Kelvin. Uh, motive power, what's, what's this thing kind of mean? What, what kind of energy is motive power? And we, we've talked about this uh, several lectures ago. I was running around throwing books around in the classroom and everything. What kind of energy is that? Potential. Motive power is kinetic energy. Yeah. yeah, it's kinetic energy, something moving through space. So we're going to talk about how yeah, something gets hot and something else moves. So, but for now, let's just take one more look at the heat equation. This is going to serve you well. We're just talking about the wood-fired hot tub and how do you know how hot it is, et cetera, et cetera. Um, here, here's your um, equation. Q equals C sub P M delta T. Um, one equation, one, two, three, four unknowns. What, if this is energy, what are the units of energy for, for uh, heat over here, this Q thing? Give me the SI unit for energy. It's a joule. Yeah, it's going to be in joules. Um, what's the SI uh, unit for temperature? K. 
Kelvin, or centigrade, let's just use C for now. Um, what's the SI unit for mass? Grams or kilograms. kilograms. Yeah, kilograms, there we go, nice. Okay, so what do the units of C sub P, the um, heat capacity of a substance, have to be? What are the units so this works out algebraically? I've got joules over here, and I've got kilograms and, and centigrade over here. What has to go in that numerator? Celsius or degrees? Uh, yeah, degrees Celsius, just like you'd say degrees Fahrenheit or degrees Kelvin or degrees Rankine, uh, degrees Celsius, exactly. And you can put a little degree there for a reminder. What, what, um, what symbol has to go into that numerator so this thing works out algebraically? Um, we're just dealing with algebra right now. I mean, we, we don't need uh, the numbers. We're just dealing in pure units. So I've got joules on the left-hand side. I've got kilograms and Celsius so far on the right-hand side. And remember, anytime you're in an equation, it always comes out to look something like this. One equals one. Change in temperature over time? Um, I don't, so, um, well, temperature is going to be involved. But as you can see, there are no units of time anywhere. So, I mean, you, you could put seconds in here, but then you've sort of, you're in another, you're in another dimension and you have to get back out of it. So the, the answer is, very, is, is quite simple. Um, well, let's, let's, look at, look, let's look at it this way. What if I had watts over here and I'd equal sign, what, what has to go over on this side? Watts. I mean, er, any equation, has to be either an energy equation, a power equation, et cetera. So um, what, what's, what's going on up here? Yeah, a joule goes right here. What's down here? Kilograms. Kilo perfect, yeah, perfect, perfect. It's always looking for, super simple. So yeah, so C sub P, those are the units. So if I go out, and let's just, let's just go online and check. And let's look at um, specific heat of water, for example. Now, there it is, 4.186. What are the units? Joules per gram Celsius. Energy per mass degree Kelvin. Okay, so again, I just want to hammer that home. You know, Tim spent a lot of time going through the word problems. Unless the units uh, balance and you end up with basically one equals one, and I'll, I'll do it right here. Joules and joules cancel. There's a one, there's a one. Kilograms and kilograms cancel. It becomes a one and a one. Degrees Celsius, degrees Celsius cancel. That's a one and a one. Unless you can sort of get to one equals one in your unit analysis, something's wrong. Okay, so um, there's heat. Uh, usually it's, it's written as the letter Q. If we get time, I, we'll, we will actually back up and go to this um, box 5.6 because it tell it, and someone want to know how do you how do you know how much heat to use on your um, wood burning hot tub? The answer is going to be right there in box 5.6. It'll tell you exactly how many sticks of wood you will need to raise the temperature in your hot tub, how many degrees. So. Um, Take a look at that. It's all right there uh, in, in, this, in that box 5.6 and in the equation that I, that I just wrote. So that, that's, your, that, that's your, your guide for that exact question I just heard raised. Okay, so let's get into chapter 6, uh, one of my favorite chapters, and see where we end up today. You gonna build one? You should. Yeah. You better. Post it. Post the superior version online to whatever else is out there. Then you might expect analysis on different types of wood. <laughs> oh, That's right. Which, yeah. which one's the best? That's right. Yeah. Full, full analysis. It's gonna be oak. So. Can I use a rocket stove versus open printing? Yeah. You can do gasification if you can manage that one. Okay. So. Again, title of the chapter, 
heat to motive power, we just reviewed more or less what heat is, thermal energy, and I think we all have a good idea of what motive power is, something that moves. A um, couple things there in the introduction. One is, um, well, motive power we just discussed. A heat engine, we'll go into exactly what a heat engine is as we move through the lecture. Uh, the next thing, it's, there's this thing in the um, chapter called prime movers, and one way to think about that is in the same way in the very first chapter of the book where we looked at primary energy. I mean, it is energy that is sitting there in nature available to be used or expo exploited. You know, your fossil fuels your, and your, your solar thermal energies. Okay, 6.2. Steam engines, the early years, uh, very first um, picture in the book, what we're looking at are two examples. So what, what's, um, what's going on here? Well, there's a, uh, a fire beneath a, um, an open uh, vessel. Well, I shouldn't say an open vessel. Inside this vessel, you have, you have water and a little bit of air. So as this closed vessel, in fact, the bottom part is closed, as that heats up, it's just like a, a kettle on top of your stove, right? As soon as the kettle starts going, the steam comes out, you hear the whistle blow, that's all this thing is. As the steam comes up through these two vents, and they're sort of serving a dual purpose of being vents and more or less rotational bearings, uh, this other uh, ball or, or sphere, if you will, has been set up in such a way that when the two, vent, when the two exhaust vents are pointed well, in opposite directions, but more or less the same direction from a, from a rotational point of view, it starts spinning. Now, uh, is this actually doing any useful work? Well, no, it's just kind of sitting there in, in place and, and kind of a, a novelty. But it's one of the first examples of a, um, a um, converting thermal energy into, um, into motive power. And the, the, um, the definition here is a, is a reaction turbine. So as, um, uh, as mass is pushed in this direction, in, in these two directions, out of the exhaust vent, the thing spins. So there's your, for every action, there's an equal and opposite reaction. And it's, it's sort of like a little rocket sitting there. And you've probably done the, seen the fireworks before where you nail the thing to the tree and it spins around in a circle. So, okay. Um, and here's another one on the right side. This is... Uh, 1,400 years later, um, this is an impulse turbine. So as, as you'll notice, it's, it's sort of two, two distinct um, technologies sitting side by side. So this, the, 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 the steam engine, if you will, is not itself um, moving, but it's providing an impulse to each one of these little blades and causing something else to spin. Now, you can imagine scale this up, and maybe you attach this to your, your loom or your um, uh, grain grinder and, and instead of using a water wheel for a mill. So again, something gets hot, a gas expands, and you can convert that to mechanical energy. So thermal energy going into mechanical energy. Kind of a weird concept. Because what I, if you remember way back in the very first couple lectures, I talked about every bit of mechanical energy ultimately becomes thermal. Well, the same is true here. Uh, as this thing spins, you've got friction down here. If they had thermal imaging cameras back in the day, you'd point it right here at the base and see, oh, it's getting hot because I didn't lubricate my bearings or, or et cetera. Um, if you took a thermal imaging camera and set it on the entire room, you would say, oh, well, all this heat eventually sort of dissipates into the room and I've got to, and, and once, by the time the thing stopped moving, Really, all you've got left is a bunch of quickly moving molecules bouncing around off each other. So, sure, for that nice brief moment in time, you did have some nice motive power. Same thing with, a, with an internal combustion engine, which we're going to see shortly. After you park your car, turn it off, things not moving, put your thermal imaging camera, and yeah, the engine's still hot. So, anyway. See, and I always thought that it, it actually did dissipate, but what it really does is as it leaves the material, the wood, it goes into the air. Sure. Well, it just heats that air around there, so it's not like it dissipates; it just travels to a different spot. 
Well, when we when we get into um, when we take NRGY 2, 235, we'll talk about the three forms of heat transfer. And this dissipation, as you're saying, is typically a combination. Well, it's going to be a combination of radiation, convection, or conduction. And in, in a sense, all three of those modes of heat transfer could be considered dissipation, if you will. So, yeah. Okay, so now let's see if we can actually put this technology to work. And, I, and this is actually a really good segue from the chapter we just covered on coal, because we all know the sort of the, the deeper you go, you, you know, you've been to the beach before with the kids and you dig in the sand and up, you know, you dig deep enough and here comes the water in the bottom. There's water below, you know, beneath us. You know, I guess our water table here in Missoula is anywhere from 40 to 80 feet down, depending what elevation you are. You know, we've got all these nice rivers flowing through. But the challenge for some of these early coal mining operations is getting rid of the water. You know, you, you dig down there and there's, there's the water. Um, I know the, the pumps at the Berkeley pit have the same issue. Um, they're all full right now. I was just talking with somebody at NCAT. But so they've got all these, um, you know, deep uh, mines under, under Butte that are more or less all filled with water because that's just, you know, where the, where the water table happens to be. So the water ends up being more or less a liability in a mining operation. So how do you get rid of it? Well, um, what you do is um, get something hot uh, right here. And the way, this, the, way this guy, the way this guy works is as this gets hot, what it's going to do, just like in the two previous little technologies we saw, the steam comes off, this valve A is open, and more or less pushes water, or, or pushes steam, and the, the water that happens to be in this vessel down. When this water is being pushed down, it closes valve C. It's just like a toilet bowl flap is all it is. You probably watched the toilet bowl flap. Mine's leaking at my house right now. It's a huge pain in the butt. Because it, you know, it leaks and the water comes out every five minutes. Uh, <laughs> My wife's like, throw the toilet away and get a new one. Like, no, it's just, it's just the, the flapper valve. I'm pretty sure we can figure it. It's not the whole bowl and have to go out. Um, but as the pressure goes down, C closes. There's enough pressure in here that D opens. And it opens and more or less forces the water out. So you've got this thermal energy in here forcing water up the tube. This valve is also closed. So you, you more or less have thermal energy overcoming, not really, um, I mean, you've got a little bit of motion, so you're turning it into kinetic energy, but you're actually overcoming gravitational or potential energy in this case, right? Okay. Does and that, then... Does that thing create a siphon and, and open C and pull water? Yeah, so the, so the next step, right, so that's a, that's a great question. So the next, the next step, um, once that little cycle has done its thing, um, C and... Um, C and D will then again close. You've got a cool water supply, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm kind of questioning why they've got, um, you know, this valve. Well, I guess, no, it's okay, because this, this water is more or less cold coming out. You know, whatever, whatever ground temperature water you have is being sort of sucked up. So now you've got this supply of cold water. Open this little valve at the top, goes into this little collection pan, turn on the shower, Shower hits this pressure vessel, and um, as expected, when that, when that cools, it then draws the water and, and does, in fact, create a siphon or suction, draws that water um, up into the tank. Of course, this has to be, um, this has to be closed, so you're not pulling from here. So there's going to be somebody standing right there working, uh, you know, valve A as, as this thing thermally uh, cycles, if you will. So yeah, it's just it's a big siphon. It's a it's a thermally controlled siphon bulb. You've probably, in fact, I've been running the dang siphoning bulb on my own toilet at home because <laughs> every time I want to fix the thing, there's always a little bit of water left in the bowl, and you got to get it out and, and fix the valve. So just a thermally driven, backwards running toilet. <laughs> That's what this thing is. Okay. All right. And if you look at box uh, six point two. It's really just a it's it's really just a um, an example of this thermal problem we just did. So if you know if you know your change in temperature, if you know your mass, uh, you know what the thermal uh, 
heat capacity of his water is, then you're going to know how much heat you have to pump into this thing. All right. So from there, and this is obviously just you know pumping water out of a mine, but you know what if you actually want to run your um, your wood lathe or want run your um, your milling operation? So a um, gentleman by the name of James Watt. Here's a picture of him. Just think, thinking hard. Um, comes up with a similar system, and all the same components that we just saw in the the savory miner's friend are 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 present in this invention as well. So here's the um, here's the hot source. You can see you've got the two valves. Um, this opens. This this guy goes up, drives the piston, and now you could you could imagine using this. Uh, shaft over here to pump water in and out. Uh, the, the reservoir is here and then um, refills, uh, refills and, the, and the cycle starts again. And in the, in the book here, in fact, I think if we get um, later, there's a little table that talks about efficiencies. And I believe... It's a little further, and we will define exactly what efficiency is. But these systems are relatively inefficient. Now, one thing that Watt added to this very this sort of primitive device was a was a flywheel, and so rather than having this thing just constantly reciprocating back and forth, uh, the flywheel more or less smooths out the, uh, the, the bumps and the starts. You probably remember some of the old tractor farm equipment. There's a flywheel on there. It's serving the exact same purpose. If you, if you look into your, um, when, you, when you get into AC circuits, ETEC 106, you'll recognize that um, inductive uh, unit, like a long coil of wire, is very similar to a flywheel. It just sort of keeps those electrons flowing. So there's a lot of parallels between um, electrical circuits and mechanical. So um, this is more or less an inductive energy storage uh, unit. So it's a little more uh, complicated, but the kind of the neat thing is you, is you realize, gosh, I don't have to just use the bottom half of my cylinder. I can more or less do the same thing on the, on the top and the bottom at the same time. So while one is expanding, the other one's condensing. Uh, sit down and work out the kinematics on it and um, sort of get double the power, if you will. And, and so in so doing, you're always increasing the efficiency by sort of getting, you know, doing more with, with less. And there's, um, there's a nice little geometry up here. This thing at the top is what's known as a four-bar linkage. Uh, these two guys are always parallel with each other, which allows um, this shaft to just always go up and down rather than having to hinge back and forth and create uh, a unnecessary friction. Because obviously friction is also your, your enemy here too. You're sort of losing heat, if you will. Okay, there's, um, there's James Watt. And so for now, we're, we're just sort of looking at stationary power plants. And I'll take a I'll take a quick break because the the next the next part is kind of my favorite. But just to just to wrap up, um, these things are big. They're stationary. In a lot of ways, they have a lot of parallels to where we are with some of our um, battery storage. Um, you know, because right now this thing's kind of sort of sitting there. It's not actually on wheels or moving anywhere. It's a, it's a similar challenge. Like, how would you take this thing and you know stick it on something that actually moves and, and pushes things around? You know, it's big and bulky. Not a very good energy density at this point. Um, it's, a, it's a similar challenge that batteries are, are finding and making their way into um, renewable energy tra uh, transportation. But let's take a quick break, and then we'll get, get back into it.